Hello everyone and welcome to lecture today. So today I want to talk about another very useful technique in applied mathematics and that is the technique of the Laplace transform. Um, this is uh, uh, related to the Fourier transform um, in some sense it's uh, coming from the same idea uh, it's what's called an integral transform that takes a function and um, creates a new function that is uh, much more useful uh, in certain contexts and certain applications. Um, specifically, uh, one of the main applications of the Laplace transform that we'll see is uh, that this is an integral transform that has this property that uh, when you take the transform of the derivative of a function, uh, it reduces it to an algebraic uh, equation uh, in the, that, that, that function in the variable, the new variable in the, the new domain that we get after we transform it. Um, so it makes it possible to reduce linear ODEs and PDEs to systems in general of algebraic equations. Which are easier to um, to solve in general than differential equations. Uh, so this is the main uh, application of the Laplace transform in applic in uh, engineering applications. Um, the general idea here is that we have a pairing of two functions. The original function. which we'll typically take as a function f of t and the transformed function which has a number of different notations. Typically we denote the Laplace transform as a curly L with curly brackets of f of t will be a new function of s, which we can denote capital F of s. Um, and sometimes we denote this as f with a bar over it as well. But given a function f of f, f of t, we should be able to find the Laplace transform, where the trans Laplace transform has the explicit definition of being the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. This is actually a more general procedure. Right? So this is the definition right here of the Laplace transform for any function f. So if this improper integral converges, uh, this this uh, new function that you get, when, uh, which is a new function of s, because this integral is a t integral here, 
that this converges, we say the Laplace transform uh, exists. Um, and generally, S may be complex. And this is important, uh, very, very important. Um, most for most of the applications we'll, we'll do uh, we'll consider the case where s is assumed to be real um, however uh, it's important to denote that in general s could be assumed to be complex um, and this idea of an integral transform is actually related to a, uh, a more general type of transform where you say the transform function, maybe we'll say g of s is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of k of s t times f of t dt, where k of s t is a multivariable function of s and t. Uh, which we call the kernel of the integral transform. So the Laplace transform of a function is just uh, a general transform with a kernel of the function e to the negative st. And it turns out that this special choice of kernel gives us a lot of very interesting properties uh, that we can, we can use um, uh, very, very directly uh, in applications. Let's do the Laplace transform of a relatively simple function. We'll do f of t plus t. This is just a straight line that's increasing for all t. The Laplace transform of this function is going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of t e to the negative st dt, which is an improper integral. So from Calc 3, we have to express this as a limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t of t times e to the negative st dt. And uh, this integral is the same thing as um, integration by parts. The integral, or the first term of the integration by parts, we get uh, t times e to the negative st over s t to zero, and then uh, plus the integral one over s from zero to t um, e to the negative s t dt. which simplifies to the limit as t goes to infinity of negative t over s times e to the negative s t plus 1 over s times 
negative 1 over s, e to the negative st, with e to the 0. Which is the limit as t goes to infinity of negative t e to the negative st over s plus 1 over s squared minus 1 over s squared e to the negative s t. And uh, this limit, the limit as t plus infinity of e to the negative s t is going to go to zero as well as this limit right here, t times e to the negative s t is the same thing as the limit as t goes to infinity of t over e to the s t which uh, with one application of lock Kopitala's rule we can show will also go to zero as t equals to zero. Remember Lopital's rule from calculus three. And the only thing that's unaffected by this limit is one over s squared. And so we get the Laplace transform of t is one over s squared. And that concludes this example. So it's a good idea to go through and verify some of the terms in the Laplace transform tables that we'll write down a little bit later. Um, but the, the idea here is that uh, typically the Laplace transform is defined for the real part of S greater than some fixed constant A um, because of the fact that we need uh, certain limits in the, the Laplace transform to go to zero. Um, in order for this integral, an improper integral, to converge. For instance, in this, this problem, right, uh, a is 0. s will have to be greater than 0 because uh, if s is negative, this becomes positive and therefore uh, these limits do not go to 0. Uh, if it is equal to zero, um, or if it's uh, less than zero, then um, these limits actually go to infinity. Right? So we have to be kind of kind of careful here as we go through and do these computations. We'll do another example. Example. 2, take f of t be equal to e to the at Laplace transform of e to the at of s or f of s is equal to integral from 0 to infinity e to the at times e to the negative st dt and this is the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t e to the a minus s times t dt which simplifies to 1 over s minus a when you go through and compute the limit. Right. The integral of this is 1 over a minus s times e to the a minus s t um, and uh, in the limit uh, this is going to go to 0 as long as s is greater than a. I really should say is the real part of s is greater than a. Same thing up here. If s is complex, it is the real part of s is greater than zero. So 
So it's always important to think about this right here. And I'll, I'll, let you, I'll leave this one to you to go through and do, just like I went through and did this right here, and justify why this is the real part of S greater than A. Um, but this will give us convergence. Example 3, I'll go through and do f of t is equal to sine of at. Laplace transform of sine of at can be a function of s. We'll call it f of s, capital F of s. This is integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st sine of at dt which is the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t of e to the negative st sine of at dt and we know how to do integrals of this form uh, via uh, tabular integration by parts and uh, you can actually check yourself I'm not going to go through the, the computation but uh, using tabular integration by parts our method from before uh, you end up getting that the integral from 0 to t of e to the negative st sine of at t is the same thing as negative e to the negative st times s sine of at plus a cosine of at over s squared plus a squared evaluated from 0 to t. So uh, at t equals 0, this just becomes a over s squared plus a squared minus e to the negative st s sine of a t plus a cosine of a t. over s squared plus a squared which also tends to zero in the limit as t goes to infinity and um, this is because e to the negative st oh, this should be negative st right here grows uh, much or sh sh shrinks much faster than uh, sine of at, cosine of at, which are actually bounded functions. So you can again use uh, the idea that sine and cosine are bounded uh, to show that this limit is uh, is zero as t goes to infinity. What that means is that the uh, Laplace transform of sine of at is a over s squared plus a squared. And this again is uh, valid as long as this uh, coefficient up in the, or the negative x in the exponential here is negative. So it's going to be for a real part of s greater than 0.
and uh, this property that we're seeing uh, for each one of these examples the function being integrated for the plus transform obeys what is called the property of exponential order so we can say that uh, first we'll define what this means a function f of t is of exponential order if the limit as t goes to the infinity of f of t or e to the bt is equal to zero because if, if there exists a real number b with this property right here we can also write this as saying that f of t is less than or equal to a times e to the pt or t greater than some constant value of time t naught. So uh, this is implying the existence of a constant a and a constant b uh, such that for t greater than t naught, so it has some index t, um, we have that the function stays bounded by a constant times the exponential. Uh, it's basically saying that um, the function eventually is bounded by this exponential function, and therefore uh, the, the limit that you get when you hit the Laplace transform, which will have uh, some form of e to the uh, negative negative st in it multiplied by the function uh, or the uh, integrated function um, but all of the examples that we've seen uh, are functions that are of exponential order um, for an example a function that's not of exponential order take uh, for instance the function f of t is equal to e to the t squared. Right, this function grows uh, much faster than e to the t, and therefore it's not of exponential order, and therefore we do have to be careful. Uh, but it turns out that uh, for all of the applications that we're going to consider, um, uh, this is uh, enough for us to, to work with. Uh, the class of functions that are of exponential order uh, are large enough. It's a large enough class of functions that it's very, very useful. Um, for instance, all polynomial functions, uh, the trigonometric functions, the exponential functions, all of these are of exponential order. Let's look at one more example. We can use the Laplace transform to even deal with piecewise functions of t. The Laplace transform of this f is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times f of t dt. And this integral will then break down to the integral from 0 to 2 of 1 times e to the negative st plus the integral from 2 to 5 of e to the negative st.
which after some uh, simplifications, doing our integrations, this becomes 1 over s minus 3 e to the negative 2 s plus 2 e to the negative 5 s. And uh, so I think I've done enough, enough examples now. Um, it's important now to go through and we'll summarize uh, in a table the important Laplace transforms that we'll see in applications. And uh, this list is not exhaustive. Uh, however, it's going to be very useful to keep this in mind. Consider the function 1, the function t to the n, the function sine of a t, the function cosine of a t, and the function e to the a t. And the plus transform of 1 is 1 over s. Laplace transform of t to the n is n factorial over s plus or s to the n plus 1 and the domain of validity for each of these is on the right and also has to be an integer here. Plus transform of sine of AD is A over S squared plus A squared cosine of AT is s over s squared plus a squared and the Laplace transform of e to the at is a 1 over s minus a which is valid when the real part of s is greater than A. So one of the things that we have here, and the reason this is working so well, is because of the fact that uh, the exponential grows so uh, quickly, or I should say the negative exponential shrinks so quickly, um, that uh, it guarantees that if you use this as a kernel, uh, as long as f is of exponential order, uh, you'll get a convergent Laplace transform, so the inner row will converge. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the nice things about the Laplace transform, and one of the reasons that the exponential function here is chosen. The other reason is how it interacts with the derivative. Uh, we're going to see that it converts uh, the derivative uh, to an algebraic relation rather than a differential relation, uh, which is a really incredible property. But let's go through and summarize some of the basic properties, and then we'll get into the more advanced properties a little bit later on in the lecture.
the first main property is linearity, which is inherited from the underlying integral operation that's being performed uh, for a given Laplace transform. So the Laplace transform of a f of t plus b g of t as a function of s is going to be the same thing as a times the Laplace transform of f of t plus b times the Laplace transform of g of t for constants a and b. Or in shortened form, if capital F is the Laplace transform of lowercase f, and capital G is the Laplace transform of lowercase g, this is always going to hold. And the proof of this is relatively straightforward. It comes directly from the fact that integrals, the integration procedure, uh, are linear. The second main property, which uh, is very useful, is called the first shifting theorem. And this is very useful because it gives us a uh, technique of going through and uh, satisfying, solving for a new Laplace transform for a new function um, if uh, there's an exponential involved. So suppose that the Laplace transform of a function lowercase f of t is some function capital F of s and this is valid when the real part of s is greater than some beta. The first shifting theorem says that the Laplace transform of e to the alpha t times f of t will always result in a shifting of the original Laplace transform by alpha. Where the real part of S will have to stay greater than alpha plus beta now. to guarantee that um, uh, this condition is satisfied. But this is very neat um, because, because we can actually go through and see this for certain uh, examples uh, in the, the previous table. Uh, so we can use this, this theorem. Let's go through first and write down a proof of this property. And we'll do that by just considering the Laplace transform of e to the alpha t times f of t. This is the improper integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st times e to the alpha t f of t dt. which is the same thing as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative s minus alpha t times f of t dt
which by the definition of the Laplace transform is the Laplace transform of lowercase f evaluated at s minus alpha. This is a direct proof. Um, but remember that because this Laplace transform is only valid when s, the real part of s minus alpha is greater than beta, this is valid when the real part of s minus alpha is greater than beta, the real part of s has to be greater than the real part of alpha plus the real part of beta, where beta is a real number. Um, so this even allows for alpha to be a complex uh, number, which is very cool. So I'll go through and do some examples. You know that the Laplace transform of one is equal to the function 1 over s. So by the first shifting theorem, the Laplace transform of e to the alpha t will be 1 over s minus alpha, where s is greater than alpha. Because this is valid when s is greater than 0. The Laplace transform of T we computed before to be one over S squared. And this gives us that the Laplace transform of t times e to the alpha t is 1 over s minus alpha squared. Which will be valid when s is greater than alpha. I'm just going to denote this the real part of s because, well, we could allow s to be a complex number. The last one is the Laplace transform of sine of t. This is just the thing that we calculated before, but with a equal 1. by the first shifting theorem. This implies that the Laplace transform of e to the alpha t times sine of t is going to be equal to 1 over s minus alpha squared plus 1. And this is valid for s greater than alpha. So this is very neat, and it also kind of points at where we're going in terms of applications, because functions of this form, this form, this form, are all seen when solving basic linear uh, nth order differential equations. Um, in partial differential equations, a uh, function like this, uh, or a function in exponential multiplied by uh, a trigonometric function, uh, governs the um, uh, disturbance of um, a mass spring system with damping. 
Um, it also governs the LCR circuit that we talked about before when we introduced um, the application of the Fourier series to uh, analyzing LCR circuits in uh, nth order linear uh, differential equations. So this is this is very cool. We also see that uh, the first shifting theorem extends the class of functions for which the Laplace transform can be determined explicitly. Uh, it extends the table of uh, Laplace transforms by a great value. Um, we're going to see that additional extensions to this table of Laplace transforms emerge from other general theorems that hold for the Laplace transform. Um, and uh, the next uh, idea is uh, what I discuss is taking the Laplace transform of the derivative of a function. And this is probably one of the biggest uh, theorems for the Laplace transform or uses for the Laplace transform in applications. Let the function f of t be continuous and of exponential order, which we could also write dominated synonym for. of exponential order and dominated by the function e to the a t. And let f prime of t the derivative of t be piecewise continuous. On every finite interval from zero to t. then for s greater than a the Laplace transform of f of t is going to be s times the Laplace transform or the Laplace transform of sorry f prime of t is going to be s times the Laplace transform of f of t minus the limit of f as we approach zero from the right. So to prove this, we're going to go through directly, and we'll let ti, or i in 1 to n, 
be the points of discontinuity. case the Laplace transform can be broken up into parts because we have the Laplace transform of F prime can be the limit as T goes to infinity of the integral from zero to T e to the negative st times f prime of t dt. And remember that um, this function is piecewise continuous on every finite interval. So we can break this integral up into the following. So the same thing at the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t1 plus integral from t1 to t2 of e to the negative st f prime of t et all the way up to the last interval between the discontinuities e to negative st f prime of t dt and lastly we have to add in the tail which is the integral from tn to t of f prime of t dt And for each one of these um, these terms, we can integrate by parts. It's also worthwhile to note here that um, this uh, expression right here, this expression right here, all of these uh, first terms, this uh, sum sum of n terms, uh, don't depend on this limit. Uh, the only thing that does, in fact, depend on the limit is uh, this last sum right here. So if we do that, and we integrate that parts uh, by doing um, u is equal to e to the negative st and dv is equal to f prime of t dt for each one of these integrals, we end up getting a sum of the form e to the negative st times f of t evaluated from t1 to 0 plus s times the integral from 0 to t1 of e to the negative st f of t dt to the next page to give you a little bit more space. The 
the second term will be this exact same term, but with the bounds from t1 to t2, t1 to t2, and then this holds for every single term up to and including the nth term. and also including the integral from Tn to capital T. And don't forget that this entire thing is, remember, take the limit of this entire thing as T goes to infinity, uh, so that limit comes down and only hits this last term right here. And what's amazing about this is that, um, well, we can directly look at this right here. Look at the first, some of the first two terms. When we plug in our boundary points here, we're going to get negative f of 0, or negative f, the limit as f, as f goes to 0, on the positive. Plus f of t1 times e to the negative s times t1. plus this integral right here. And this is added to this term right here. Which is e to the negative s t2 minus times f of t2 this is t2 from the negative minus oops, I forgot to put in this is f of t2 t one from the uh, the right or actually from the left This term is then this minus e to the negative s t1 f of t1 from the right minus s times the integral from t1 to t2. Of e to the negative s t f of t dt 
And so this uh, entire expression simplifies to a sum of jumps of this form. And specifically because of the fact that f is continuous, at any one of these jumps, ti, the limit at ti from the right is equal to the limit of f at ti from the left. And so we get a cancellation in the first two terms of this e to the negative st1 cancels with this e to the positive s or negative st1 f of the limit from the left. Okay, and this also happens at every other term here. This t1 cancels this t1 when you plug in. This t2 cancels the t2 in the bottom part of the sum. And this ke keeps happening all the way down the line. Um, until we are left with the following. Also note that this summation right here from 0 to t1, t1 to t2, uh, tn minus 1 to tn of all of these, these integrals summed together is just the integral from 0 to tn. So we have the, the Laplace transform of f prime. Is equal to negative f of zero, the limit uh, of f as t goes to zero from the right, plus the limit as t goes to infinity of e to the negative. st times f of t plus s times the integral from 0 to tn of e to the negative st times f of t plus the limit as t goes to infinity of s times the integral from tn to t of f of t times e to the negative st to t. And I want to emphasize here that this cancellation goes through all the way up to tn minus 1, and at tn it's canceled by this term right here. Um, so that's important just to emphasize why we're getting this from. But we also have that because f is exponentially dominated, this is also 0. And we can pull all of our terms together now to claim that the Laplace transform of f prime of t is just s times the Laplace transform of f prime or f of t minus f of zero, the limit of f as uh, t goes to zero. And this concludes our proof. Uh, the reason I went through and did this is because I wanted to show that, uh, you know, proving stuff uh, with plus transforms always is going to uh, revolve around using the definition or uh, subsequent property that you've proven. But uh, the idea is that this is a hugely, hugely powerful uh, result. Uh, and I want to make the remark that uh, this immediately allows for extensions to other derivatives.
or higher order derivatives. Case in point, if you want to take the uh, Laplace transform of the nth derivative of the function t, as long as uh, the assumptions of the previous theorem uh, hold for fn and fn minus 1, uh, we can go through and write down the formula from the previous theorem. It would be a good exercise for you to prove this s to the n times the Laplace transform of f of t minus s to the n minus 1 times the Laplace transform or times uh, the limit of f as we approach 0 from the right. Minus s to the n minus 2 times f limit as we approach 0 from the right all the way down or sorry this should be f prime all the way down to s times the n minus second derivative evaluated in the limit as t goes to zero minus lastly the n minus first derivative of f limit as we push zero from the right. So this this formula is a general formula. Uh, for calculating the, the nth derivative, or the plus transform of the nth derivative of function f, uh, particularly, which will be useful when we go through and solve some second order ODEs, the Laplace transform of f double prime of t, which is the second derivative, will be equal to s squared times the Laplace transform of f of t. minus s to the 1, we have s squared here, so s to the 1 times f limit as x goes to 0 from the right, or as t goes to 0 from the right, minus f prime at 0 limit from the right. So for a quick example of how to use this, right, let's try and find the plus transform of sine of AT by using this method. Well, we know the Laplace transform of sine of AT already. We computed it uh, let's use the, the formula for uh, the derivative. We know that if f of t is sine of at, f double prime of t is going to be negative a squared sine of at. which is negative a squared times f of t. So 
to the Laplace transform of f double prime of t is equal to negative a squared times the Laplace transform of f of t by linearity But on the other hand, by uh, the formula that we just derived, s squared, this is equal to s squared times the Laplace transform of f of t minus s times sine of at. as we approach t from the right, this limit, minus a cosine of at, which is the derivative of this function sine of uh, at. Oops, and I have a little typo there, let's put a right here. Fix that. And this is a cosine of at, the limit as t goes to zero from the right. So we get that s squared times the Laplace transform of f of t minus a, and this limit is zero, this limit is one satisfies this equation and lo and behold we have a system of equations that we can solve for the Laplace transform because we use the definition of the derivative to directly show that Laplace transform of f double prime, this simple function has to be equal to negative a squared times the Laplace transform of the function itself. So this term is coming from the definition of the derivative and knowing how to derivative, uh, take the derivative of sine of at. Uh, this term is coming from the, uh, applying our property that we just proved, uh, but we have that this system now has to be satisfied, and we can easily go through and solve this system of one equation to find that Laplace transform of f of t has to be equal to a over s squared plus a squared which exactly matches what we found before. So this is a very uh, interesting example. It's a cool example that just kind of uh, shows uh, one way that we can go through and uh, use the Laplace transform to verify things, and uh, it ends up being very useful.